让泪洒着。Well, I see the pictures of every night from the day they died. And slowly you tend to run away. And again, will I find that it's worth the time? We're gonna get started, so if everyone wants to get their drinks and congregate, I encourage people to sit at the front, bowing down here. Started. Whoop, whoop. Can everyone hear me? Yes, all the way back there. All right. Thank you for coming. My name is Fiona. I run a monthly plus. This month it's like three events, which is stupid. Um, lit series called Hard to Read. Usually we show out of the standard hotels in Hollywood or downtown. Tonight is our first event, a collaboration with Naval. Come on. I'm bringing up a lot of um, hard to read is forcing people to, who usually don't come on stage to come on stage. I often ask. It's putting me on the spot. Yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So I'm Amanda. Welcome to Naval. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit more about this space. Um, so we're in the process of turning the space into more of an organization and we're interested in exploring uh, alternative economic systems that can support artistic practices. And next month we have, I think, pretty good programming coming up. So if you have the chance and you're interested, please sign up to our mailing list and it's on the kitchen counter over here. And I hope you enjoy the evening tonight and we'll be excited to um, be here for Lovelace and the release of Broadband. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Amanda's work is in this room. It's called Hygienia, and she'll tell you all about it if you want. Or you can read about it on the internet. Um, I, I don't know how all of you came out here either because I don't recognize a lot of you, which is kind of unusual. So if afterwards you want to be on my mailing list for other events, please come at me. Um, so yeah, we have a full, we, we're, we're here to celebrate women in the internet. Um, the excuse and reason is for this book, Broadband, by Claire L. Evans. <laughs> which is a very ambitious undertaking to write a popular history of women in the internet and specifically how they have been omitted from histories of the internet and from its um, documented development. Um, my mom is in this book, which I think is why I put many, many hours into putting on two events. We did one in New York last week, and I think we have a bigger showing here. It was comparable, though, and it was a very good event. So you have to stay around and make it a really good event so that we can out-event New York City. Um, we have books for sale at the back by Skylight, Claire's book, and then a series of texts that we curated based on our theme. The event is called Lovelace, which my friend Janik, who edits at Semia Text, came up with um, for Ada Lovelace, who's an early computer engineer, and um, Linda Lovelace, who was a porn star, because there's lots of porn online, so we decided to call it Lovelace. So there's books about porn and women and the internet at the back, um, including I'm Very Into You by Mackenzie Wark, who is someone who read for us in New York. I also have 
And it's like, I'm a bookseller, so this is amazing my job. This is a new book by Amalia Allman that's coming out next month, and I have a display copy if you would like to see. We'll do an event with it later. Um, I think that's all my notes of business. So, our first, I get, mm, I don't need to do that. Our first speaker reader tonight will be Alice Barker. Alice is an activist and programmer. She developed support, helped develop, it was a three-way collaboration from what I understand. Uh, support FM, a crowdfunding tool for bail bonds for LGBTQ youth in prison. Um, she rides a motorcycle, has an affinity for crop tops, and has many fervent opinions. You can follow her on Instagram at Puppy Codes if you don't already. <laughs> and you should. Um, and tonight she'll be talking about arming women online. Is that right? Yeah. What, what did I say that m made you laugh? Ooh, who texted me? Uh, the crop top thing is funny. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming. There's lots of people here. And Max Nanis, number one programmer rock star right there, who I went to college with. Um, beautiful person. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk tonight, <coughs> since the topic is about women in the internet, um, and you even interestingly men mentioned pornography, um, which, you know, the internet has a large history of. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit about, like, what it's like to be a woman <coughs> online, and some of the work that I've been doing recently, um, which has been with uh, specifically like women who've had their nudes leaked um, or hacked, um, and finding ways to um, basically make uh, it more dangerous for women uh, for to hack women uh, online um, by like arming women specifically with offensive tools as well as defensive tools in software. Um, so uh, that's like a little bit of the work that I do. Um, and uh, I do a whole bunch of other stuff like engineering and I'm totally addicted to Instagram. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, it's pretty awful to be a woman online um, in general, uh, especially a trans woman. There's a lot of um, tokenization that happens obviously and um, you know, if I want to find porn of, like, a person who looks like me, I have to type in, like, she-male, or, <laughs> you know, like, it's under the taboo section. Um, so being, like, a walking taboo is kind of a weird thing. Um, and sometimes I joke with my brother that actually identify as a she-male now. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> obviously I'm kidding. Uh, that word is just, like, so weighted in this, like, kind of history of, um, I don't know, straight white males jerking off. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of interesting like perspectives on women specifically online and, um, and the way that, you know, um, the way that women are targeted specifically by uh, mostly men who are interested in, you know, um, basically like violating their privacy and um, threatening them for sexual favors or other things like that. So one of the um, things I've been doing with some celebrities um, that I've been working with who had their nudes leaked in the fappening, I don't know if you ever, you heard about that? It was like a thing a couple years ago where all these celeb nudes came out. Um, so I've been making these things called honey pots um, and they're basically like uh, really easy to hack, like shitty um, iCloud accounts and other things like that that hold files. Um, and then we'll drop a malicious file in there and wait for someone essentially to download it. Um, so we hack back basically um, someone trying to like exploit uh, a woman online. So the whole idea is like let's make it more dangerous and less like you know um, less of like a an easy in, quote unquote easy target. Um, <coughs> so that's one interesting thing that I've been doing. Um, yeah, uh, another thing that I've been um, research. I, I do a lot of security-based research. Um, there's a multitude of information that can be found out about you online, um, and there's even like specific kinds of information that you wouldn't really imagine uh, is unique to you. There's this great website called amiunique.org, um, and it basically fingerprints your browser with all of your specific fonts that you have installed and 
uh, little configuration changes, and you might think you haven't applied that many to your to your browser, but it's like nine out of ten times your unique you have a unique fingerprint online that can be traced anywhere you go. Um, so it's interesting to think about when you know uh, you're thinking about like you know what kind of actions you're taking online and how easy it is to like trace the things that you do. Um, it's it's pretty easy if if you know what to look for. Um, so yeah, uh, even things like a VPN, for example, or like a uh, an encrypted um, uh, like using Tor or something like that. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, there are all kinds of ways to you know figure out who you are um, through. There's like an example would be like a, there's this thing called a timing attack, basically where you you watch when somebody logs in and makes a request to the website, and when somebody shows up, and statistically, even though you're not sure who you know came from where you can see statistically that it's most likely that this person logged on in California and then the person at the at the end of the website like also showed up at the same time and you can nail down like basically who is looking at what through that statistical timing attack um, which is kind of interesting so you leave a lot more traces online than you would than you would imagine I guess um, and there's this constant you know sort of like threat of mostly like shitty men trying to like <laughs> attack you. Um, there's this interesting, I'm, I'm trying to like make this sort of quick. I, I kind of like put together some points, but I wasn't sure how long I was gonna talk, so. Um, uh, feel free to like ask questions or if I didn't say anything you wanted to hear about, I can say it after. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I guess the other thing is um, <clears throat> there's an interesting psychology of escalation that happens when you let somebody know that you're uh, aggressive towards them online. So if you tell someone, okay, like I'm gonna, um, you know, like I'm gonna get you back or something like that, or or you do something and you leave a trace or you leave some sort of like, you know, tidbit behind or breadcrumb, there's this like escalation that can happen over time. Um, I had a friend who was a, a dominatrix and she had a bunch of, um, basically like this client that sent uh, a bunch of nudes of her in a threatening way to her parents uh, to try and control her and force her to like date him and, and all this stuff. And um, you know, it's, it's obvious when you set up a revenge basically, right? So revenge is like a pretty clear motive. Um, so finding ways to like avoid that clear connection between like, okay, I want to make it more dangerous and more difficult for this person to like attack and, and um, threaten me, but at the same time I don't really want to let him know that I'm like, you know, perpetrating this attack or making it very like obvious that I'm the one fighting back against you. Um, otherwise things can get crazier and crazier and crazier and, and generally you want payback and then you want to just like walk away, you know, and not continue the, the pain of you know, what what you're going through. Um, yeah, um, I don't know, I don't I wasn't sure what else to talk about really, but um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, yeah, do you, should I say anything specific? Do you have any like, any like, I'm a little lost, sorry. This event was somewhat disorganized because I was sick in bed for the last five days and then I was in New York like making out for the last, the days before that. Um, so, so my apologies. I think we can keep moving on, and then unless somebody has a question now, I was going to leave time for questions at the end, 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 end. Let it, let them ruminate. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank well, you, Alice. Thanks for letting me blab at you for a few seconds. The last note, the last note on her thing was just, don't trust companies. <laughs> we didn't make it that far. Um, so our next performer is going to be Lauren McCarthy. Do you have your own mic? I do. Matt, is that good? That's good? We're live streaming right now. Hi. One person in the world is watching, my father. I know. He's my
you know, software, performance review people, and other things on the internet. She was an assistant professor at UCLA Design and Media Arts, and she was chairing the sections on the most recent performance titled Lion. Listening for the sound of him, I hear the knock. Awkwardness of the first meeting always gets me off. Somehow we've the, somehow we've both agreed to this thing in concept, but didn't have the capacity to comprehend what it might feel like. For a while this past year, every box delivered from Amazon came wrapped in blue Amazon Echo tape. Even if we had not encountered an Alexa in the wild, we were made to feel that everyone was using them. Well-designed websites offer a collection of smart devices that ship overnight in perfectly fitted packaging. Every detail of these devices feels right. But we're being sold devices to outfit our homes with surveillance cameras, sensors, and automation offering us convenience at the cost of privacy and control over our lives and homes. I have a very good question for you, Lauren. Um, I forgot to mention my algae medicine. Did you see me take it? Yeah, I forgot to mention my algae footage jumping to different moments when she might have taken it. Relying on this mix of memory and video data feels dubious, and I suddenly realized there could be consequences to getting the answer wrong. I feel, I'd feel so much more confident if I were an algorithm. been attempting to become a human smart home, a better version of Amazon Alexa. Anyone can visit my website and get Lauren in their own home. 
The process begins with the systematic installation of a series of custom network devices that include cameras, microphones, switches, door locks, faucets, and other electronics. For days, I remo remotely watch over each person, 24 hours a day, sleeping when they sleep, controlling all aspects of their home. I attempt to be better than an AI, understanding them as a person and anticipating their needs without them even having to ask. I'm watching him play video games and worrying I'm not fulfilling his desires, but I'm also hesitant to act in case I annoy him. I scan through his emails hoping to find a clue as to how to connect with him. It's depressing that I'm just as shy as a smart home as I am as a person. In some cases, they never even meet me, and a crew installs and deinstalls a system while I sit miles away. I could literally say and do anything. I'm performing a character, I'm playing a smart home, yet I'm still unable to escape being me. Can you start at the, at the beginning? She gets into bed alone tonight. She's obsessed with the idea of someone climbing through her window through the night and sleeping with her. She's been researching rope ladders on Amazon, asking friends if they would indulge her. When they all turned her down, she turned to TaskRabbit, Instagram, Craigslist instead. I like the thought that I could keep her safe by watching. If someone came in, I wouldn't judge with my watching, but I would be ready for the moment I felt the sign and get them to leave. In a virtual nod of acknowledgement, I opened the window as I turned on the lights. We are meant to think smart home devices are about utility, but the space they invade is personal. The home is the place where we are first watched over, first socialized, and first cared for. How does it feel to have this role assumed by artificial intelligence? Our home is the first site of our cultural education. It's where we learn to be a person. By allowing those devices in, we outsource the formation of our identity to a homogenous group of developers. They may not share the values or cultural reference points that we want to embed in our family's home. And women, long seen as the co keeper of the home domain, as complicated as that notion is, are now further subjugated. Their control is undermined by the smart home assisting in shaping each activity. She likes to imagine that she doesn't eat anything at all. Her mind has found a way to keep her alive while having that illusion by eating small pieces of things and throwing the rest away. I do my part by making snacks with small pieces and replacing half-eaten boxes of cereal. I hate the thought of the wasted food, so I have the leftovers delivered to me and I eat them as I work. It's 1 p.m. in Amsterdam now, while it's 4 a.m. in LA where I am. I got up with them a few hours ago and struggled to stay awake as I helped them cook lunch. The time, language, and culture differences create a clear sense of distance, yet our interactions are real time. I don't think we are built to have relationships with interfaces between us, but what can we do? Um, Jennifer Moon. Um, Jennifer Moon. 
is a very cool artist and a revolutionary beauty. Her exhibit, A Breach in the Realm of Beliefs, is up at the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena right now. Tonight she'll be performing the last segment from At the Edge of Space and Time, Extending Beyond Our 4% Universe, which has been entitled to 5% Universe. I meant to get a clarification on the 4 to 5 point, but I didn't. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, so this is, um, as you know, saying, I do a segment of a high sharing fire comic that I originally performed in collaboration with Law, that's a hand in the hand, and also with the The entire performance is about an hour long, and it's titled At the Edge of Space and Time, Expanding Beyond Our 4% Universe. The segment it's retitled to At the Edge of Space and Time, Expanding Beyond Our 5% Universe. The change from uh, 4% to 5% is due to the changing data of the percentage of the observable universe that is deemed dark matter and dark energy, which is currently 26.8% and 68.3% respectively. Uh, together, dark matter and dark energy make up 95.1% of the known universe, which makes ordinary matter, or baryonic matter, which is everything that we can see and observe, um, only 4.9% of the universe. So that's where that comes from. So we essentially live in a 5% reality. Um, uh, oh yeah, so the, the video was made for like, uh, projected big on this like long wall, so it's like really tiny, but imagine that it's supposed to be um, bigger. Do I, am I okay to go without that thing? Yeah? Okay. Oh. In Edwin A. Abbott's novella, Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, the narrator, A Square, who lives in a two-dimensional world, experiences a three-dimensional sphere passing through his flat 2D world as magically growing and shrinking circles. A Square believes a sphere is a circle playing tricks on him, as A Square cannot comprehend depth and therefore cannot conceive of a three dimensional object. Similarly, we, in our 5% understanding of the universe, cannot comprehend freedom and therefore cannot conceive of concepts like justice, difference, revolution, love, and faith beyond the framing of binaries placed within hierarchies. These expressed notions of freedom point to where quantum field theory and dark matter and dark energy intersect with our 5% dimension. Yet we can only realize these freedoms as so much as the manifestations of our bodies allow, bodies which have been shaped into implements to sustain a system that can co-opt any attempts to expand beyond our 5% universe into capital. In a seemingly inescapable such system such as ours, how do we transfigure our bodies to access the abyss unreachable by the matrix of our beliefs? It is through an acceptance of death, but not death as in the absence of life defined by this system. Rather, it is a death of beliefs and a death of self which will allow emerging into many an aggregate formless body eluding all attempts of measurement. In our 5% reality rendered by our beliefs, it is beneficial for the system if we perceive ourselves, each other, and everything else in our world as discrete objects, separate entities, individuals, in order to generate self-interest. Individuals pursuing self-interest are ultimately easier to control. Feminist physicist Karen Barad questions the pre-existence of individuals with her concept of intra-action. It is generally assumed that interactions happen between individuals who existed prior to the exchanges. Intra-action queers this assumed belief of causality by asserting that individuals materialize within exchanges. Intra-action, which can be described as the mangling of people and things and other stuff's ability to act, makes inquiries into how differences individuals are made and remade. Similar to quantum physics, where particles lack definite physical properties, 
there are no inherently bounded and property things that precede our interactions with particular apparatuses. The larger apparatus, in this case, our fiber set matrix constructed from our beliefs, enacts particular cuts that create differences based on the measurements used in each exchange, and then renders us as individuals with defined properties within that phenomenon only. In other words, intra-action reveals the artificial boundaries we forgot we invented and helps us to think in simultaneity. By perceiving our 5% reality through interaction, we can more easily identify the belief entities that tell us we are separate, different, and unlike one another in an attempt to make us easier to control. Now that we understand how we have become host to belief entities that take up residence in our minds, which then shape our bodies and dictate our actions to keep us fixed in the 5% universe, how do we begin to see and interact with each other and the world around us beyond beliefs? Through our second brain, of course. There exists an often overlooked network of neurons lining our guts that is so extensive, some scientists have nicknamed it our second brain. Technically known as the enteric nervous system, our second brain is made up of a complex and plentiful network of neurons too complex and plentiful to just aid in digestion. This multitude of neurons enables us to feel the inner world of our guts and listen in on the tens of trillions of microbes who live within our bellies, which combined with additional microbes sharing other parts of our bodies make up approximately half of who we are. We are made up of anywhere between 30 to 50% human cells and the remainder 50 to 70% are cells from over 1,000 different species of microbes. We are not singular beings, we are multiple. And since our brains and our heads have been taken over by parasitic belief entities designed to keep us locked in a 5% reality, it's time to use our second brain and our guts and listen to our microbial gut fairies who can expand our perceptions based on feelings rather than beliefs. Gut feelings and gut instincts are not just figures of speech. Want more proof that we are not individual beings living amongst discrete objects? Let's look at how gene expression works. Most cells in our bodies contain every one of our 22,000 or so genes. But in any given cell, at any given time, only a tiny percentage, less than 10% of those genes are active. This variable gene activity called gene expression is how our bodies do most of their work and determines the details of our bodily form, as well as our health. Previously, scientists thought of our bodies as stable biological structures, fundamentally separate from the world, unitary organisms living in the world but passing through it. Now, we are learning from the molecular processes that keep our bodies running that we are far more fluid than we realize the world passes through us. We are porous beings. Our social environment, who we hang out with and how they behave, can change our gene expression dramatically to the point where we can literally change who we are. By merging with our tens of trillions of gut fairies, we can stimulate horizontal gene transfer to unlock the 90% of dormant genes in our human cells. These dormant genes could be the key to transfiguring our bodies, to enable emerging with each other and everything that is, to form an aggregate, formless body, much like a slime mold, social amoebos who queer the nature of identity by calling into question the individual group binary. As a collective entity that merges into many and enjoys multiple indeterminacies, we can avoid all forms of measurement that fix us in a 5% universe and venture out into this, the 95% of darkness where we can discover new forms of difference, not determined by the binary hierarchical beliefs of our 5% reality to keep us contained within it, but difference that is beyond language and beyond anything we can yet imagine.
Thank you, Jennifer. It's hard to go after that, but actually Mandy can go after that, so she's ready for it. Um, our next reader performer is going to be Mandy Harris-Williams. Mandy is a writer and educator who thinks a lot about desire. She's at Ideal Black Female on Instagram. Shh. Uh, tonight she'll be sharing something from her Brown Up Your Feed pamphlet series and information sessions, which we have for sale, and we're going to be selling them, and you should buy them after. Also, you can buy books. Um, Mandy will also introduce Martine Sims' pre-recorded video that we have, so we'll do a, a segue now for that, I guess, introduction. Did I have anything else? Nope, nope, nope. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Am I gonna have to say like, s next slide please? Um, you might. I love that. <laughs> I'm gonna enjoy that. Hey guys, um, I'm Mandy. I'm actually, I prefer to um, introduce myself as Amanda. I prefer to socially go by Amanda because Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> but it has better SEO and you know <laughs> that's what we're talking about today right um, so uh, I'm like I'm a little bit over aroused from that last <laughs> performance <laughs> excuse me <laughs> Woo, that was awesome thank you <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, this color values pamphlet. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the work we're doing for like per color values and this hashtag, which I encourage you guys all to like imbibe, absorb, and use hashtag brown up your feed. You can kind of probably predict a little bit um, about what it's gonna be about. <laughs> um, let me go into my Google Docs here. Okay. Um, so, um, how I got into like thinking about uh, the internet is that I'm obsessed with it, and um, I enjoy like having lots of interactions on the internet. Um, I'll give you like a little bio. I'm like an only child. I uh, no, it's fully an only child. So, <laughs> um, like I didn't have peers to interact with in my home. Um, so I like was really stoked for the internet um, and enjoyed like getting on it and being in chat rooms and like having a life like on the internet. Um, and I, as I've like grown with the internet, I have noticed like, oh shit, like racism happens on the internet as well. It's just like another format. So um, hashtag brown up your feed. The effort behind brown up your feed is for us to acknowledge our racism that occurs. Um, oh, racism, I, I brought that word in too hot. Our, <laughs> our tendencies towards whiteness. <laughs> <laughs> um, that occur on the internet, particularly in our feed, right? So that's the brown up your feed. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so let's get um, into the brief, brief social media and screen history, right? So like the practice of looking at a screen and getting information or getting storytelling from that screen is like relatively recent. Um, specifically, I, I wanna introduce you guys to this film, um, Bir The Birth of a Nation, <laughs> which is adapted from the novel, The Klansman, <laughs> which is <laughs> not as artful a way to put it. Um, and so basically this movie um, was made in 1915 and the tagline was the mightiest spectacle ever produced and it truly was. So before this, like movies were like 10 to 15 minutes, super chill, bop in, bop out, no biggie. This, <laughs> this one was like this massive undertaking. It had like a way larger production budget than like any other movie before its time. It established a lot of what we think of as like film language, right? Like certain tropes of film that we expect to see and the way that blacks were represented in it was, um, <sighs> well, per these three next bullet points. Okay, so we were presented as mammies or toms. I'm not sure if you guys, I'll, I'll explain that. Mammies and toms are uh, agreeable Negroes. So, you know, they like to step and fetch. Should you require a water? Boss, I'm happy to get it. Uh, 
<laughs> Only you laughed, perfect. Oh my God, you guys are on your best behavior. I love this crowd, thank you, Fiona. Um, <laughs> um, after that, like brutal bucks, so it's kind of this um, idea of like, you know, a really like strong black man dingo um, who's gonna like fuck all the white women and like watch out. So that was another character in that movie. And then there was also a tragic mulatto. Um, you, you might know her from such updates as Monsters Ball. Um, <laughs> and in this film, the tragic mulatto is Lydia, and she is having an affair with Senator Stoneman. It's basically like um, a like southern epic, kind of like Gone with the Wind style. I, I recommend watching it if you haven't. Um, I'm not going to get into it because I, I promise only five minutes and I owe you like ten minutes from the last event we did. So, <laughs> um, so this film was basically, it just established a bunch of really ugly tropes about black people, um, some of which were established from literature such as Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, but largely were just kind of these um, discussion points or concepts of understanding about blackness that had been kind of being narrated throughout society. Um, Woodrow Wilson loved the film. <laughs> he said, it's like writing history with lightning. But you know, think about this, right? This was like the first major feature film. I'm not qualifying that anymore. It was like the first major feature film and this was the language um, of how blacks are to appear. And actually, um, there's kind of like this whole theory of black film studies that suggests or argues uh, or examines that we haven't really moved very far beyond these tropes of blackness. Um, so the question that I've been really interested in um, on the internet is what are the screen prototypes of contemporary screen representation, right? So how are they racialized? So, um, you know, let's say we're looking at our feeds, right? And we come across black people. Do they fit into these neat categories? Is that because black people feel they have to fit into these neat categories in order to be identified or popularized on the internet? Perhaps. Um, so who are the Bucks, Mammies and Toms, and Tragic Mulatto Lydias of our social media worlds? I'm not, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like work after this. <laughs> um, and then like, <laughs> and then like, so what, right? Like who is D.W. Griffith and like, what does he matter? Why do we care? Um, D.W. Griffith was this storyteller who believed very firmly in white supremacy, like most of his peers in entertainment. And um, we should care because <sighs> Hollywood is still comprised of D.W. Griffiths. I mean, we have the um, you know Me Too movement, which has really been born out of like identifying um, lots of sexual abuse, sexual harassment in Hollywood. Um, obviously, it's still very present in our understanding and our portrayals of race. It's just that um, we haven't really developed a language to fight against that. So that's what Brown Up Your Feed intends to do in part. Next slide. So. Um, as I discuss this idea of brown up your feed, I've gotten a lot of questions. I got a really um, good question the other day of like, what does it mean to brown up your feed? Can I brown up your feed? Shout out, Shelly. Um, so I'm gonna explain like what the working definitions of brown up your feed are so that you guys can feel equipped to actually do um, what the hashtag asks of you. So brown has a particular set of physical and conceptual values. Physical values, like brown means something physically, right? So um, I, I'm not gonna go into this because it's like, it's obvious and it's apparent if you look at a Pantone like survey, right? So we did this kind of, um, it's hard to see the text here, but these are all Pantone colors, right? If you were to look just at Pantone without like the politics of what that Pantone means, you would see, you would be able to identify like, oh yeah, this is a brown, this is a taupe, this is a tan, right? Um, the conceptual values of what brown means. So brownness um, in today's like lexicon means like a, a lot of things. Lots of people don't identify black people by the word 
Brown, which um, is a political decision, um, which I vibe with. I, I like being called black. Um, but like my skin color is brown and that has a value and it has a very particular operation in society uh, which I have to own and operate by. Um, and there are many people who are brown who have to use uh, the melanin that they have been blessed with and um, you know catalyze that into some sort of success despite vigorous anti-brownness in our landscape, yeah? Nods mean you get it, you feel me? Okay, cool, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's like two brown people in here, like let me know you're catching on. <laughs> it's an educational lecture. <laughs> um, okay, so brownness is, in this context, particularly the way that I'd like to use it, non-whiteness, um, and that means not necessarily just Brownness. So there are two sets of values that we're working here with, right? One, hue, and two, like, concept, politics. Um, when I say non-white, I mean indigenous to the Americas. I mean indigenous to Africa. Let's talk about browning as a verb. Um, so when you think about browning, right, if you were to brown a chicken, I hate to make this comparison. <laughs> Please watch how vigorously we're giggling. <laughs> um, seriously. Um, but as a verb, it means a thing, right? So like if your appetite depended on it, you would know what brown meant, right? But then like as we interact for some reason, we like to act dumb about this shit. No, you know what brown means. So as you go through your feed, I implore you to think about like, huh, if this were a chicken, <laughs> would it be edible at this point, right? Like, if there's a very physical understanding of what brownness is. And um, so how does race play into this? Because I've been skirting around race. I haven't really talked about it specifically. I got the question, can Latinx people or Asian people brown up their feeds? And so what I would ask you to do is think about how large those definitions are, how ethnically and racially encompassing those definitions are. And I think the best way to um, think about this is that Andre 3000 jumpsuit. Um, across cultures, darker people suffer more. There are dark Asian people, obviously, like East Asian and South Asian people. There are darker among them people. There are people who fit more suitably or comfortably into a white phenotypic ideal. Um, and same thing with Latinx people, right? We know that there are um, multiple ethnicities and races that go into that larger umbrella. So when we think about brown up your feed, mm, and we think about like, okay, like, you know, we socially congratulate ourselves for having like X percentage of our, the folks that we follow and are influenced by as Latinx, but what sort of Latinx people do we tolerate influence from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you for those snaps. Um, so, Brown Up Your Feed asks you, sorry, I'm holding this kind of close. Uh, Brown Up Your Feed asks you to investigate who do you follow and what does that mean? It asks you to investigate what are the rules I make for myself about who I follow? So who is constituted as popular? Who is constituted as worthy of being viewed? And are there racial tendencies of what I am viewing, right? It's really easy to look at your feed and give it a brown paper bag test. Do you guys know what this brown paper bag test is? Um, I'm going to explain what the brown paper bag test is. When my father went to college, um, he's my skin tone. When my father went to college, it was a historically black college. And um, he went to like a party and there was a brown paper bag on the door. He was like, what is this? And he later learned that if you're darker than the brown paper bag, you are not to enter that party. 
Um, that's at a historically black college. So these white supremacies, uh, they work regardless of race. It is truly um, a marker of privilege to be phenotypically closer to the white norm. Um, okay, cool, let's go to the next slide. So um, these are questions to help you brown up your feed. And I'm actually kind of curious if I'm, I want this to be like uh, informational. So if anybody wants to contribute, I don't feel like informa best informational is not necessarily central didactic. So which elements of social media have escaped the forces of capitalism and white heteropatriarchy? Which ones? Right. <laughs> Right, exactly. So when we think, when we link this back to like the first slide, right, which was like birth of a nation, we might link it to say, okay, um, so which of my, wh who in my following does not fall into the category of like a really solid like black woman who's out there like pushing ideas and agendas, laborers, or um, who in my feed is not like, a black neoliberal, which might fall into a larger mammy umbrella. It might, I said might. <laughs> um, or like, who is like some sexy mixed girl who like, you know, is my tragic mulatto, who I'm like kind of feeling real sexy nowadays, tragic mulattoes. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it begs the question like, how, how much white supremacy are we choosing? You know, we, we've, um, I think our generation has a privilege of choosing who we follow and yet we have the tendency to fall into this narrative of like what we expect to see, what we expect to congratulate, what we expect is worthy of our attention and so we kind of fall and follow into this white supremacist feeding. Um, I have a question about like data um, and the consequences of having white supremacist feeds. Um, and when I say like white supremacy, I mean like white heteropatriarchy, right, binaries. Um, so like, have you ever thought about why are followers analytics divided into only two genders? And what are the, what are the consequences thereof? Yeah, you brought your mouth all the way to the side. You're like, bitch, I know, yeah. So I mean, when we think about also like, Instagram is making a major push to sell us shit now. And like, you're, you're being boxed into one category. Okay, there's, like, there's definitely a consequence. I don't know what it is. That's why this is like, if you have, if you have an idea, like, you can raise your hand. Yeah, Alice. I was reading recently about um, how shitty AI is at identifying uh, faces um, with people of color. Like any POC face, it, it's like the average is like super bad for how accurate it is in terms of like recognizing someone's face. And that tells you a little bit about who's programming this stuff, <laughs> you know, where it's, how it's slated and how they test like, oh, is this product effective or not? Um, so that, f for me, falls into, like, the categories of also, like, two genders are also, like, facial recognition is being lumped into that whole thing of, like, what does a woman's face look like? What does a man's face look like? And we all know how that turns out, so. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I invite you guys to, like, think about that and integrate that into your thoughts and consciousness as you use social media. Um, and then uh, I'm also thinking about like production and access. So when we think about like, um, you know, you might think of like, oh, this is a quality picture, right? Like it's got a nice lens, it's got good quality, there's good like colors. And um, sometimes I, I don't think we think about the uh, machinery, right? Okay, so then you back solve, right? You have this image that's been produced, and then you back solve, you take a step back, what was the machinery required in order to produce that image? And then you think about the cost of buying that machinery, and then you think about, is that 
ability to afford the machinery to participate in social media equally accessible per race? Thank you for answering. Um, so yeah, there's not, there's not access to generate what we consider like quality social media um, and obviously there's going to be a skew. Um, and then you think about like, I would recommend really, really, and you don't have to do it with me, but I would recommend giving your feet a paper bag test. Loving that snap. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bet. <laughs> I'm gonna bet you guys got a lot over here. I'm gonna bet you maybe have a couple black women who fit into maybe like this category. Like she probably mixed with some category. Um, and you guys probably think that's cute. I bet, I bet, like subconsciously. Um, I, I think that's cute subconsciously, right? Like we've been fed a lot of media information to understand desirability and cuteness as the tragic mulatto sleeping with Senator Stoneman, right? Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So, um, I have some pamphlets that you guys can buy if you want more information about this. But the question I wanna leave you with is what does it mean to work against white supremacy in social media? Um, and that's where Brown Up Your Feed comes in. It's a series of questions wherein you ask yourself, can I make my feed as black as it's going to require to overturn the intense tide of white supremacy that has now invaded our government? because it really does get all the way to that. I mean, if we, wanna, if we wanna think about like the history of social media interacting with our elections, we can think very easily. We can recall President Obama and the tide of Facebook support that helped him uh, get into office. We can also think about the 4chan tide of support that supported Donald Trump getting into office. And I believe that Instagram is important in helping us understand understand um, visual tropes. So what does it mean to work against white supremacy such that we can have a new iteration of government? How can that reverberate throughout society? Um, is our attention limitless? We can follow as many people as we want, but how many people can we truly invest in and pay attention to? Um, and what is the consequence of all of those people being white or very light skin or very um, pro-white, no, 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 not pro-white, white, white phenotype normative. Um, and lastly, I wanna make a, a short note on appropriation because I think it begs the question of like, um, so the central, one of the central issues of America is this black-white binary, right? So if we're talking about white supremacy, it might fall, one of the ways we might categorize that is under three, um, three notions. One would be like um, classically termed anti-Orientalism, which would be like anti-Asian, anti-Middle Eastern otherness, right? This is where we get our like anti-immigration sort of discussion. You also have anti-blackness, which is bound up in black people doing work and not getting credit or capital. And then you also have anti, um, you have like uh, colonialism, which is taking land, erasing indigenous people and acting like they're not there, right? So how many, how many indigenous people do you follow? Or like how many indigenous people are internet popular? Or have we erased them? And are we exacting another colonialism in the internet by acting, sorry, oof, by acting like there are not indigenous people who are influencing or making attempts to influence on our social medias? Um, and then how many, how much blackness are we using at no cost, right? Like that is the central action of what it means to be mm, white supremacist in this country is to take black products, to take black artworks, to take black inspiration and use it with no credit, right? Like how many of you guys used a black GIF in the last week and didn't pay? 
by the pamphlet. Um, <laughs> in the pamphlet, you will find helpful tips for how you can brown up your feed and how you can unfollow whiteness because our attention is not limitless. So maybe there's some white folks that really don't deserve your attention and you should follow me at Ideal Black Female. <laughs> and that, that's the sum total of what I've got to share with you guys today. Thank you very much. So, a um, little bit more me, show. but not me this time. How I'm going to try to channel. Well, I hope. It's been a big year for you. I, first in I used to teach seventh grade, so I'm really good at that bitchy, I'm waiting phase. <laughs> Um, I have the honor of introducing the work of my friend Martine Sims. Um, Martine is uh, Martine is like the coolest artist because Martine does art just to have fun, and she doesn't care what any of you think about it, and it's still the best shit you'll see. So let me read this. This is a written piece to introduce the video that we're about to watch. In her words, Martine Sims, August 13th, 2013, scientists say sugar at safe levels considered harmful. Judge orders changes to New York's stop and frisk policy. Elon Musk announces Hyperloop designs. I am 25. I work as a web designer at an American retailer that specializes in fashion for young women. Our office is downtown. My studio is 0.6 miles south, and I go there most evenings until midnight. I am invited to participate in a night of internet girl performances and reading. I guess it's a bit like a lean-in circle, but less professional and more fun and more art. My boss gives me a copy of Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. I read it over the weekend. On Monday, my boss asks what I thought of the book. I am mildly, mildly critical. I say, she makes it all sound so easy. On my lunch break, I write a letter to Cheryl. After work in my studio, I record myself reading the letter. I upload it to Facebook, visible only to me, and I take a screen recording. The next day, I send the video via WeTransfer to the woman organizing the night of internet girl performances and readings. I title it, Body Issues. I write, thanks for creating the space to make a project like this. I don't think I'd have felt comfortable under other circumstances. I do not feel comfortable. I am proud to be an internet girl. Woman, I feel shame about being marked. After the event, I ask them not to post or share the video. I ignore all requests to view it. I throw away all the clothes because I look terrible in them. I don't watch the video again for five years until last night. I can't remember what the big deal was besides hating myself. It is an effort to recall the many ways I was treated like an alien for loving my tech. I realize I met enough aliens along the way to stay the course. In my living room, I shout, we are not the same. I am a Martian. Dear Cheryl, how are you? Well, I hope. It's been a big year for you. I first encountered your work in Ken Oletta's 2011 profile for The New Yorker. At the time, I owned a failing bookstore and made the decision to close the business. I wanted to look at you as an example, but I'm nothing like you. You did everything right. Straight A's, an economics degree from Harvard College, an HBS MBA, a stint at McKinsey, Treasury Department Chief of Staff at only 29, Google Executive, Facebook COO. I don't even know if I can be like you, but I want what you have. I kill for a data body like yours. You have a highly developed virtual form. 
A few months ago, I was at a party in West Hollywood, and I got stuck in a kitchen conversation with a moderately attractive British creative. We talked about advertising and money, eventually landing on the topic of prodigies. The 13-year-old Yale grad, a kid who sold his fucking app to Yahoo for $30 million. How old are you, he asked. When I said I was 24, he seemed relieved. Good, you've still got time. Party's over at 25. After that, all of your success is expected. I'm 25. Sure, I'm no prodigy, but I'm smart and funny and gainfully employed. I work hard, I read, I write. I contribute to the world. I have friends, you might even call it a community. My life life is great. My professional life could always be better, but that's capitalism for you. I recently finished Lean In. It took me a few months because I was swayed by bad, bad press and because I question your politics. Good job. It had a lot of very practical advice. I appreciated your choice to eschew personal anecdotes in favor of hard data. All of your stories end with a statistic. I like that, my kind of woman. I still have a few questions, though. First, when do I get the fancy car? No, really. Why don't you talk more about the pleasures of success? It must be fun to be a one percenter. I want to know what fucked up dinosaur eggs you have in your treasure chest. I want you to have a ticket, or three, for Virgin Galactic's inaugural flight. I believe you when you say you're not in it for the money. But what's the money like? Describe it to me like one would tell a starving child about chocolate cake. Like every American, I grew up middle class. The rich kids I knew went to private school, and their parents were doctors or lawyers. The poor kids got lunch tickets and never had to be anywhere. Your middle class might have been a bit different. I'm also black. I bring this up as a purely economic dimension. On average, the wealthiest blacks live in neighborhoods that are worse than the neighborhoods of the poorest whites. America has a brutal tradition of punishing black ambition. I don't care, Cheryl. I'm ready to sit at the table. I just want to know what it's all for. Is it worth it to you? I'm forging ahead, blindly for now, but I would like to have a reason at some point. Is it wrong to just want money and power? Isn't that sort of radical in and of itself? To quote Sister Soldier, America is business, and without business, you will have nothing and be nothing. For my birthday, I requested a consultation with a celebrity psychic. Her name was Carol. She lived in Dallas, Texas. We Skyped for one hour. The reading was amazing. The biggest takeaways were, do what you love and stand up for yourself. When I told, she said I was a real career woman. When I told my sister, she said, you are a career woman. When I told my mom, she said, that's great, Mar. I am a career woman. I've been working really hard. I tripled my income over the past year. I started listening to books on tape so I could cram more CEO reads in between HBR podcasts. When I get off work, I go to my studio and work some more. Most nights, I stay up until 3 a.m. And the other night, I actually convinced myself that this was normal. I said to my boyfriend, how do we know that everyone else doesn't do this? I want it, Cheryl. I want it so badly. I mean, I think. I'm pretty sure. Do you ever feel like your career is bullshit? Like having a career is a total dehumanizing mindfuck that you should avoid at all costs? 
Like straight up conspiracy theory, public school teaches you to work for the man shit. Like sitting on the toilet in the office bathroom for way too long because Dolly Parton was right. It's all taken and no given. I made the mistake of sharing these feelings with a colleague. There's medication for that, he joked. Seriously, Cheryl, does your work make you feel more or less human? According to Eric Brynjolfsson, director the MIT Center for Digital Business, 65% of American workers occupy jobs whose basic tasks can be classified as information processing. Our jobs weren't made for humans. Our jobs were designed for robots. I want people to look at my work and think a robot did it. I want my data body to be perfect. At the same time, I want to be free of my data body. I want to become a martyr against the corporate and public state. I want to be more than the ways in which I've made money. The professional is personal. Professionally, I feel both too much and not enough. I've internalized the metaphors of excess and lack as the poles of my journey from margin to center. This profound, constant tension has come to dominate my thoughts. I might be reaching, but as a project, Lean In embodies this chaos. Even as I write, I can't decide whether you're margin or center. And maybe that's the point. Thanks, Martine. Thank you. All right, we have one reader left, and that's going to be Claire, whose book we are launching. There's books at the back from Skylight. I encourage you to buy books. I encourage you to tip the waiters who gave us all the wine that all of you drank. We're going to have a DJ afterwards, Night Jewel Ramona. So I encourage you to stay, but we're out of alcohol, so I encourage you to bring some in if you want to do that. Um, or whatever substance you need to keep you here. Oh, weird. A person I slept with this summer just texted me. How's everything going? The writing, the events, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> he works for Peter Thiel, this guy. He's an... <laughs> I know. He's an Australian model who works for Peter Thiel. Oh, and now that mic went out. Again. This is a conspiracy against it. Okay. Uh, I... Are you ready? We're coming up. I have one note, and this is I'm this is the note that I'm most nervous about. So, um, hard to read puts on lots of events. I don't know how you ended up here, but this is a hard to read naval co-production. Hard to read is very hard to maintain. It's a lot of work on my behalf, which I'm fine to do. Um, we're trying to publish a series of zines, and we're trying to build a, build a website that Alice is building right now. Um, at the second to last event, someone suggested putting around like one of those church baskets for donations, like you do in church or at AA, because... I want all events to be free so that they're accessible to everyone. But if you do have funds to share, I'm going to do the modern call for um, a church basket and say to Venmo me at Princess Grace of Monaco. That's Fiona Duncan, Princess Grace of Monaco. Like a dollar, two dollars. It's going to go to a series of zines by Ariana Reigns, Alicia Novella Vasquez, Alake Schilling, Alex Ferrand van der Donk, Amalia Ullman, and Alexis Blair Penny, among other artists whose names start with A and other events coming soon. Yeah. Princess Grace of Monaco. Like um, Princess Grace, you know. The one in that beautiful wedding dress. <laughs> yeah. Of Monaco. Thank you, Fiona. I mean that like, 
Not just right now, thank you, Fiona, but just like, thank you, Fiona, in a more general sense. <laughs> she made this happen. I'm not entirely sure that I des deserve to know you, frankly. But uh, thank you all so much for being here. It's very touching to me. I don't know any of you, so I know none of you came for me, but um, it's still touching regardless. And those of you that did come for me, I, I love you. Um, okay, I just wrote this book. It just came out last week. Um, it's, a, it's a feminist history of the internet. Because I want to be doxxed. Um, so far, so good. No, no haters. Um, it's, it spans like 200 years of history and a lot of the stories are interrelated and, and kind of difficult to pull out on their own. So I'm gonna read a chapter at, a very short chapter, I know it's been a long night, um, that is sort of the most self-contained of these stories and I think perhaps one of the more kind of visually compelling, which is why I have this slideshow. Okay, and I'll, I'll skip through some stuff so that you still have something to look forward to when and if you purchase the book. <laughs> The Longest Cave. The longest cave in the world is in central Kentucky. Its limestone passages stretch 400 miles beneath the earth in twisting patterns as intricate as the roots of ancient hickory forests above. Slide. It's <laughs> my bag boy, everyone. <laughs> Inside, cavers skirt bottomless pits, past fountains of orange stone, and discover deep, icy, subterranean rivers. Between the sunlit world and the depths below, white mist swirls at ankle height like the breath of ghosts. Kentuckians have fought bitterly to control access to the secrets of Mammoth Cave. In the early 20th century, locals conned tourists into the sinkholes on their land, spurring cave wars that ceased only when the National Parks Department took control evicting landowners and installing staircases, subterranean toilets, and even a grand dining room 267 feet below ground, its ceiling encrusted with snowballs of gypsum crystal. Slide. The snowball room, it's real. Serious cavers now enter mammoth's wild entrances through locked grates using keys granted by the parks department. Slide. They bring with them small carbide lamps to keep warm and to light the darkness. The earliest people to map Mammoth were enslaved, installed underground by landowners to lead tours. The first of these guides, Stephen Bishop, named its features, the River Styx, the Snowball Room, Little Bat Avenue, and discovered the eyeless white fish that swim in its deepest waters. Slide. When Bishop was sold along with the caves to a Louisville doctor, he was ordered to draw a map from memory. The fish. As cave maps always do, his drawings looked like a bowl of spaghetti dumped on the floor, but it detailed nearly 10 miles of passages that Bishop had discovered alone and remained the most thorough map of mammoth for more than 50 years. Slide. One nameless noodle, a passage forking off from the subterranean Echo River, became important again a century after Bishop was buried near the cave, his grave marked only by a cedar tree. In Bishop's lifetime, every landowner in central Kentucky claimed a cave entrance, if not a natural sinkhole, then a crevice blown open with dynamite. Bishop believed that all these fragments were linked into one larger system, and his instinct was shared by generations of Kentucky cavers. At the bitter end of their remotest passages, the caves breathe, Cold air whispers even miles below the surface, and water siphons deeper and deeper into the earth. Proving Bishop's connection theory became the cause of the Cave Research Foundation, a ragtag group of caving enthusiasts who spent nearly 20 years linking the caves of neighboring mammoth into a single flint ridge system. It was a family affair. Once they were old enough, children who grew up playing in the woods surrounding the foundation's lodge pushed past the farthest point surveyed by their mothers and fathers. By 1972, the Cave Research Foundation had surveyed nearly every Flint Ridge lead to its endpoint, sometimes with 10-hour belly crawls through womb-like tunnels. The final connection, as they called it, was imminent. The cavers believed that Flint Ridge met Mammoth past a choke of boulders at survey point Q87, a spur miles from the service, but moving the boulders with lengths of metal pipe was backbreaking. One expedition tried an alternate route through a vertical crevice called the Tight Spot, Caving humor is nihilistic. 
The tight spot is a dark slit so small that only one person in the party dared to enter. She was a reedy computer programmer. Finally, right? <laughs> All of 115 pounds named Patricia Crowther. Slide. Pat wedged herself into the tight spot and came out the other end onto a mud bank. In the cool carbide light, she spotted the calling card of a previous visitor, the initials PH engraved on the wall. Back at the surface, her party kept the discovery secret. Anyone familiar with the area would know the legend of Pete Hansen, who had explored Mammoth before the Civil War. Those had to be his initials, which could mean only one thing, that Flint Ridge and Mammoth were connected in a single contiguous cave spanning 340 miles. The monumental discovery would come to be known as the Everest of speleology. Pat returned to broach the juncture 10 days later. Just beyond the tight spot, they waded into muddy water up to their chests until only a foot of air separated the river and the dripping cave ceiling above. Soaked through and caked with mud like chocolate frosting, they struggled to keep their headlamps dry. Eyeless fish skittered around their waists, and when the passage opened, it revealed a wide hall where they glimpsed the edge of a hand railing, a tourist trail in the heart of Mammoth Cave. The link was complete. Only moments before, they'd been farther afield than any cavers in history, but now, weeping and falling over each other in the water, they were only a few steps away from a public restroom. Slide. Riding back to base camp in the back of a park ranger's pickup, they looked up at the stars in the summer sky. Lying in the open truck bed with the treetops filing past overhead and falling away behind into the darkness, they contemplated their feet in silence. The long drive reinforced its magnitude. Had they really traveled seven miles underground, the final passage through the tight spot and beyond what would come to be known as Hansen's Lost River joined the unmarked line on Stephen Bishop's hand-drawn map. After hamburgers and champagne at dawn, they slept. It's an incredible feeling, Patricia wrote in a journal account of the trip, being part of the first party to em enter Mammoth Cave from Flint Ridge. Something like having a baby. You have to keep reminding yourself that it's really real, this new creature you've brought into the world. It wasn't here yesterday. Everything else seems new as well. We wake up on Thursday and I listen to a Gordon Lightfoot record. The music is so beautiful, it makes me cry. The creature Patricia felt she had brought into the world had always been there. What she'd given birth to that day was not the cave, but the map. Not the thing, but its description. By wedging herself into the tight spot and bringing her lamplight to the darkness, she moved an earthly plane into the symbolic Cartesian plane. Or at least that's how she might have seen it, being the map maker. Back home in Massachusetts, Pat and her husband ran a map factory, tracking the cartographic data each expedition surfaced. Both being programmers, they brought technical sophistication to map making. As Pat described it, they typed raw survey data from muddy little books into a teletype terminal in their living room, which was connected to a PDP-1 mainframe computer at Will's workplace. From this data, they generated plotting commands on rolls of paper tape using a program Will wrote Pat contributed a, su a subroutine to add numbers and letters to the final map, which they carried over and plotted using a CalComp drum plotter attached to a Honeywell 316 that was destined to become an ARPANET IMP. The maps were simplified line plots, but they represent some of the earliest efforts to computerize caves, a leap in technical sophistication made possible by the hardware to which they had access, a PDP-1 mainframe and a Honeywell 316 a 16-bit mini-computer, both far beyond consumer grade. Will Crowther's company was Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, BBN, a Massachusetts company. This is them. Got, it took too long to get to them. A Massachusetts company that specialized in advanced research. In 1969, BBN was contracted by the U.S. government to build the ARPANET, the military and academic packet-switching network that spawned our present-day internet. A few years after they used it to plot their maps, the Honeywell 316 mini-computer was repurposed and ruggedized to become an interface message processor, or IMP, slide. What we now call a router. These routers formed a sub-network of smaller computers within the ARPANET, shuffling data around and translating between primary nodes, a vital component of the internet then and now. Will was one of the strongest programmers at BBN and a lifelong mountaineer. He taught Patricia to climb, and was known to hang from his office doorframe by the fingertips when deep in thought. He was a caver, too, 
and the couple spent all their vacations underground. I get cold when he's not keeping me company, she wrote in one caving diary. diary. There's quite a draft here. The cave is breathing. Will didn't come along on the connection trip. He'd been at Patricia's side earlier, but the final survey fell in early September, right as their daughters, Sandy and Laura, aged eight and six, were headed back to school. One of them had to stay home, buy the girls their books and school clothes, take them to the dentist, and register them for classes. Will knew how much the expedition meant to Patricia. She had found the lead, what cavers call going cave, and she was dying to see it through, so he told her to go ahead. When Pat came home, moved by the experience, Will was waiting for her. They stayed up late, holding each other and talking about the connection. When Will fell asleep, Pat crept to the teletype terminal in the living room and entered, as quietly as she could, the bearings of the survey they had made in Kentucky. She ran a coordinate program, and the data spooled into her hands in the form of a long paper tape. In the morning, they brought the tape to Will's office, and she watched the computer plot the link she had made beneath the earth between two vast and lonely places. Now I can sleep, she wrote. Slide. Caving is unforgiving. Until the late 1960s, anyone trying Mammoth Cave would have passed the glass-topped coffin of Floyd Collins, a country caver who died pinned by a boulder. Cavers become enveloped by the earth, their every move constrained by walls of rock. They eat very little and carry their waste with them to the surface. They have no sense of time. They may be surprised to see the moon. As the Crowther's friends wrote in a book of their account of their connection trip, the route is never in view except as you can imagine it in your mind. Nothing unrolls. There is no progress. There is only a progression of places that change as you go along. Making the route visible is the central pursuit of serious caving. They had a doctrine, no exploration without survey. A map is the only way to see a cave, and making maps is caving's equivalent of summiting mountains. To stay safe, cavers map as they go, and it's no wonder their hobby attracts computer programmers. Code is a country populated by the fastidious. Like programmers, cavers work in groups, but they always face their challenges alone. Not long after the connection, Patricia and Will divorced in 1976. Alone and surrounded by their maps, including an extensive survey of the bed quilt section of Mammoth they'd made together in the summer of 1974, Will consoled himself with long D&D campaigns. Shout out to my GM, who's here. And late nights coding at home. When Sandy and Laura visited their father, they usually found him hard at work on a long and elegantly structured string of Fortran code. He told them it was a computer game, and when he was done, it would be theirs to play. The novelist Richard Powers writes that software is the final victory of description over thing. The painstaking specificity with which software describes reality approaches and sometimes touches a deeper order. This is perhaps why Will felt compelled to make one last map, not plotted from his wife's notebooks, but rather from his own memories. Translated into 700 lines of Fortran, they became Colossal Cave Adventure, one of the first computer games, modeled faithfully on the sections of Mammoth Cave he had explored with Patricia and mapped alongside her on a computer that would form the backbone of the internet. Colossal Cave Adventure, now known as Adventure, doesn't look like a game in the modern sense. There are no images or animations, no joysticks or controllers. Instead, blocks of text describe sections of a cave in the second person. Oh, that's out of order. That's Patricia. Slide. There it is. In order to interact with this cave, you give it verbal commands. Terse imperative commands like go west or get bird, which trigger onslaughts of description. The puzzles are an endless shuffle of magical inventory. To pass the snake coiled in the hall of the mountain king, you must unleash the bird from its cage, but you can't get bird if you're in possession of the black rod because the bird is afraid of the rod, and in turn, the crystal bridge will not appear without a wave of the rod, and all the while you are in a maze of twisty little passages, all different or worse, all alike. This would have been familiar to Will's colleagues in the Dungeons and Dragons campaigns they played after work. I'm gonna skip the description of D&D for your sake. <laughs> You know. If you're saying all, you know. After the divorce, Will's, Will and Patricia's daughters came to expect that they'd play computer games whenever they visited their father. According to a researcher who interviewed members of the Cave Research Foundation, 
One glance at the game was enough to identify it immediately as a cathartic exercise, an attempt by Will to memorialize a lost experience. Once he'd finished coding, Will saved a compiled version of the game on a BBN computer and left for a month-long vacation. It might have stayed there had his computer not been connected to the new network his company had helped to build. Mm -mm, slide. By the time Will finished his vacation, adventure had been discovered by people across the ARPANET. Where Patricia linked caves, Will linked nodes, and adventure, a mental map of their expeditions, traveled wherever those links were forged. It was a phenomenon. The game was as unforgiving as caving itself. It was maddening to navigate and addictive to play. Productivity in computer science labs ceased every time adventure made landfall on a terminal. Its journey into the earth is now considered a foundational text of computer culture. It must have been strange for Pat. By the time she encountered adventure in 1976 or 1977, she was Patricia Wilcox, having married the leader of the 1972 expedition. So saucy. <laughs> Will's computer game proved a delightful oddity for the experienced cavers that she knew, and indeed for anyone who knew Mammoth well. But she did not immediately recognize it. She told a researcher that it was completely different from the real cave, except it wasn't because Mammoth cavers who tried adventure found they needed no maps. It was so accurate they could navigate from memory. As the game spread and adventure players made pilgrimages to the real cave, they found they could scramble down the twisting passageways secure in their knowledge of the game's map. Like the fluorescein dye with which speleologists trace the course of underground streams, adventurers' version of caving culture stained the entire network. Cavers seek connections, which they discover through survey, collective effort, and a willingness to forge into the darkness, knowing full well that when the end appears, it may be a small place, a crack in the rock so tight only the wind can broach it. The game Adventure is a set of instructions for recreating the cave. Those instructions explode into pencil passageways, antechambers, and pits. Slide. Adventure can be won only with a map, just as caves are survived only by those who know the way back out. I'm telling you the story of Mammoth Cave, of Stephen Bishop and Patricia Crowther and her husband Will, heartbroken as he memorialized their adventures in code as a way of reminding you that every technological object, be it, be, be it a map or a computer game, is also a human artifact. Its archaeology is always its anthropology. The most famous archaeologist to study Mammoth, Patty Jo Watson, inferred an entire agricultural economy from the grains digested by the corpses preserved in the cave's constant temperature and humidity. To understand a people, we must know how they ate. To understand a program, we must know its makers, not only how they coded, but for whom and why. Adventure has been remembered, celebrated, canonized, and satirized. Crowther is now considered interactive fiction's J.D. Salinger. But the domestic context from which adventure emerged bears exploring. Will Crowther wrote the code after divorcing the woman with whom he'd mapped the cave, Adventure Emulates. Some other stuff, which I'll skip. Patricia Crowther had been a Fortran programmer at the Haystack Radio Observatory when she graduated from NI MIT. Like many technical women at the time, she left computing behind to raise her children and to cave, naturally. When she returned to work in the late 1970s, everything had changed. She went back to school, enrolling in all the computer science courses her university had to offer eventually taking a job as an instructor. In her classes, which were often attended by hundreds, she remembers seeing plenty of female students, but they would be the last generation of women to enter the field in substantial numbers. The, professional, the professionalization of software engineering marks a sea change in the gender demographics of computing. By 1984, the number of women pursuing computer science degrees in the United States began to dive, and it has kept diving to this day, a decline unrivaled in any other professional field. Slide. The Honeywell 316, oh, that's the archaeologist Patty Jo Watson. You can skip this one. The Honeywell 316, the microcomputer at Will's workplace that would become a router on the early internet, has one more claim to fame. Oh, that's the Haystack Radio, radio Observatory. <laughs> Slide. <laughs> there it is. Honeywell made a model of this computer for women <laughs> with a built-in pedestal and a cutting board. <laughs> it's sold in the Neiman Marcus 1969 Christmas catalog as the Honeywell Kitchen Computer. 
It cost $10,000 and came with an apron and took two weeks of programming classes to learn how to operate. But the catalog picture shows a woman in a long floral dress unpacking a basket of groceries on top of the computer as though it were an extension of her kitchen counter. You can't read this, but it says, if only she can cook as well as Honeywell can compute. <laughs> Implying that the computer has more authority, power, and intelligence than its female user and on her home turf to boot. As Patricia's ex-husband's game grew in popularity, it was men who congregated around networked terminals to play it late into the night. It was men who scribbled cave maps on notepads lit by the electric glow of the screen. It was men who emerged dizzy in the light of day from each long crawl. And for all that Patricia accomplished in the many tellings of her story, she has remained a background figure. Although she mapped and charted a subterranean world, which Will popularized with a game and made a physical leap into the unknown that few would ever consider, her presence is a spectral outline of what might have been. She has been hidden in plain sight. It's fitting that our network, our, the network century's inaugural collective experience would be adventure. It's a story about how intimately people influence software and how wide its impact can be. And caves were always virtual worlds, the first places where human beings experience the ontological disembodiment we now so strongly associate with projecting ourselves on screen. By flickering firelight or by the shutter of a CRT monitor, we see beyond the real. Symbols applied to raw granite, to canvas, to code. All of it lights up the darkness. There's a lamp in the cave. Do you know what to do? Get lamp. Good. Now hold it tight. We'll need to take it with us. We'll take it through the twisting passages until they open wide to the other side and we can finally see the writing on the wall. A scrawl 100 years old. It's our magic code, our cheat code, our jump cut through the night. You can barely read it in the carbide light. Even when women were invisible, it never means they weren't there. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. That's it. Thank you. Um, stay. We're going to have music by Night Jewel. Tunes, tunes. <laughs>